This week, we're learning the Sikha of Parshas Kisisa Tovshinun Beis. It can be found in Sefer Asichas, Tovshinun Beis, Chelek Beis, page 423. And just to note that this is the very, very last full Fabrengen, that is Mugo, that is edited by the Rebbe. And be Ezra Sashem, we should hear new Sikhas, new Fabrengens, and see the Rebbe, Melech Biyofia, take it from Yad Mamsh. So the Rebbe starts off the Sikha by saying that in Parshas Kisisa we find a special thing, a special chidush, a novelty. In this Parsha is being discussed matters from one extreme all the way to the other extreme. We have the story about the first Luchais being given. We have the Cheto Egel and the breaking of the Luchais. The Parsha discusses the Tikkun fixing up and the atonement for the Chet through the Tefillah of Moshe Rabbeinu. We speak about Moshe Rabbeinu seeing the Kavay, the glory of the Ebeshter. There's the Yedgimel Midas Harachamim, the giving of the second set of Luchais, and all the way at the very, very end of the Parsha, Koran Oyr Pnei Moshe, how Moshe's face is shining as, and is radiant. Even though, of course, these are all things that did happen as one flow and one continuation, one to the other. Nevertheless, in addition to the fact that we need to understand why the Torah, now Torah we know is Lashon Hayra, is always a lesson to us, why the Torah needs to tell us Ba'arichus with great length about all of the negative things going on, especially that one may ask, whatever happened, happened. And usually Torah avoids speaking about the disgrace even of a non-kosher animal. So the question is, why does the Torah generally have to relate all of this to us? And especially put it all together, even though, yes, technically they did all happen one after the other, but they seem to be things that are so far apart from each other, so different to each other, from one extreme to the other extreme, with the greatest distance in between them, as the Rebbe goes on to elaborate. On the one hand, we have the first set of Luchais, which are the greatest and highest thing that were given from above, given from Hashem. As the Pasuk says, Luchais Maisei Elikim Heimo, that the Luchis were made by Hashem, written by Hashem. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you have the breaking of the Luchis because of the Egel. Now that's obviously the greatest, greatest descent. We have on the one hand the Yudgimu Midas Harachim, the 13 attributes of mercy, and Moshe Rabbeinu seeing the glory of Hashem. Once again, this is something so high, so great, and so powerful. We then have the giving of the second set of Luchas, which is a completely different category, as the Pasuk says, P'sal Luchom, Moshe Rabbeinu himself has to carve it out. It comes because of the sin and the breaking of the first set of Luchas. They're given in a completely separate time. The first set of Luchas is given at the end of the first 40 days. The last Luchas are given at the end of the third set, of the last set of 40 days on Yom Kippur. So we're speaking about things that are quite different to each other and far apart from each other. And nevertheless, they all come as one continuation with one flow and one parsha. From this we understand that it is important to know that they are all part of one hemshech, of one inyan. Furthermore, in our parsha, the parsha also discusses the details about the quality and the greatness of the first set of luchais. Luchais even ksuvim be'etzba elikim, that they're written by Hashem, that they're written and can be read from both sides, that the Hashem is the one that made them, wrote them, and engraved on them. And furthermore, even when we speak about the Luchais acharonis in the parsha, the Pasuk is once again emphasizing how the first Luchais are greater. By saying the Abish telling Moshe Rabbeinu, Luchis Avonim, you should carve out two stones like Harishainim, like the first ones. Meaning they're only similar to the first ones, but they're not as great as the first ones, which were made by Hashem Himself. And the question is: if we want to speak about the details of the first set of Luchais, it would have seemed more appropriate to put that in at the end of Parsha Mishpatim where that's the main place that the Torah discusses the first set of Luchais, where the Torah says, Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, come up to the mountain, I will give you the Luchais of stone. Whereas in this Parsha, since it seems to be that we're only discussing this as an introduction to the story of the Egel and the breaking of the Luchais, it would have seemed that you could have just said 
very simply and very briefly that Hashem had given to Moshe Rabbeinu the first set of Luchos, and then the people saw Moshe Rabbeinu was delaying, etc., etc. So the question basically is, how does it make sense that in the place where we're going to be speaking about the chet, the, the sin, we're going to be speaking about the breaking of the first set of luchos. Why is it specifically here that we're now being told new things about the quality and the greatness about the first set of luchos? The Rebbe says it's similar to a posik loyeg larosh chas v'sholem. It's similar to an idea of laughing at somebody, laughing of a poor person that doesn't have, laughing at somebody that doesn't have something in a similar way here. Dafka, when we're breaking the luchos, we're suddenly starting to speak about the greatness of the luchos. Obviously, from all of this is understood that the luchos harishonis over here, the first set of luchos, are not only being said as an introduction, as secondary to the story of the eagle and the breaking of the luchos. Rather, the Torah wants to give us a message over here how all of this is one unit. It's one Indian. There's the luchos harishonis, the first set of luchos, the breaking of the luchos, and the second set of luchos. Even according to Rashi, that we know that there's a muktum mu'ukhar but Torah, that Torah is not necessarily written in chronological order. And Rashi explains that the story of the ego was a long time before the Mishkan was built, because Shiva Serbatamus is when the Luchis were broken. Yom Kippur, the Abishta fully forgave the Yidden, and that's when they got the second set of Luchis. And after that, they started donating for the Mishkan. The Rebbe says, nevertheless, seemingly this is still not an, uh, an explanation enough to tell us why the Torah has to tell us all of these details regarding the first Luchos, which seemingly once again would have been at the end of Parshas Mishpatim. And furthermore, based on what's known, that even when we say in Mukdum Mu'ukhar B'Torah, there's still a reason why Torah is giving us a specific Torah. Every matter of Torah is obviously completely and 100% accurate, including the order of Torah. So the question is, why are these things discussed over here in Parshas Kisisa? In addition to this, this has the Rebbe, it would seem to be that there's another aspect at the end of the Parsha that seemingly doesn't have a connection at all to all of this, and that is the Tzivui, the command for the Sholish Regolim. How does that fit into the whole story of the Luchos, the first set, the breaking of the Luchis, the Cheto Egel, etc., and the last set of Luchis. Says the Rebbe in Sev Beis, this question becomes even stronger when we look at the name of the Parsha. The name of the Parsha is Kisisa. It is known that the name of a Parsha represents and indicates the point of the whole Parsha. If that's the case, we need to understand regarding our Parsha, the name Kisisa simply is referring to the command at the beginning of the Parsha to give the Machatis HaShekel. Kisis over here literally means to count when you want to count the Yidin. Seemingly, this doesn't have a connection to most of the parsha. As I said before, most of the parsha is discussing completely different issues, which seemingly have no connection to the beginning of the parsha. Furthermore, the story of the Egel, which is such a big part of our parsha, is a Yerida, is a descent that there's nothing like it. We are told that by the Chet Eitz there was a certain impurity that came into the world, had gone away by Matan Torah, and by the Chet Egel that returned now. Chet Egel is considered the head, the root, the source of all other problems, of all other sins. The Pasuk says that the Abishta says whenever he's going to punish him, part of the punishment is also going to be for the Chet Egel. And now let's think about what the name of the Parsha is. Kisisa which literally means lifting up, Kisiso Esroj B'nei Yisrael, lifting up the head, the elevation of the Yidin, how does that fit with the tremendous descent of what the whole Parsha seems to be speaking about? Says the Rebbe, in the end of the Parsha, we have a story about Moshe Rabbeinu's face shining, being radiant. And the question over here also is, why is it that Moshe Rabbeinu gets this specific, special advantage of his face shining so brightly, specifically after the second set of Luchos, and not after the first set of Luchos? You would have thought that Moshe Rabbeinu, by the first set of Luchos, already had tremendous Gilu Yashchina, 
similar like in the later days. And Adraba, on the contrary, the Gilu Yelikus, the revelation of godliness by the first set of Luchos, since they were made by Hashem, would have been even greater than the last, than the second set of Luchos, which were made by Moshe Rabbeinu. In addition to the fact that the first set of Luchos was coming straight after the big Shturim, the big commotion, and all of the excitement of Mat and Torah, whereas the second set of Luchos were given silently and quietly. How does it make sense that it's specifically by the second set of Luchos that Moshe Rabbeinu gains this extra glow of light? Explains the Rebbe in Sev Gimel that to understand all of this, we're going to first have a look at the idea that every single parsha in the Torah, out of the 53 parshas in the Torah, every single one of these parshas has something unique about it, in which it is different to all of the other parshas, as can be understood from the fact that we read every parsha from the beginning to the end, we read it once a year on the Shabbos of that parsha. So every parsha has its unique message, its unique inyan. So too regarding Parshas Kisisa, in addition to the fact that Parshas Kisisa is a parsha for itself, Parshas Kisisa is an amazing parsha, which has a chiddush, which has something unique and different to compare to all other parshas. And that is that Parshas Kisisa includes inside of itself what we would call the whole Seder Ishtalshulis. Parshas Kisisa includes from the highest of the highest things, from the beginning of the beginning, to the lowest of the low, to the end of the end, as the Rebbe will explain. Starting with, as the Ishtalshulis and everything going on in the world is described in Torah, because we know from Torah, everything else comes out. So Parshas Kisisa, in a sense, includes everything from the beginning of the Torah to the end of the Torah, and therefore, Parshas Kisisa is a Parsha that includes really everything. And the Rebbe is going to explain how that is. The truth of the matter is, everything in Torah really includes all other Inyanim. As the Mishnah in Perkei tells us, Really, everything is to be found in Torah and in every part in Torah. And the Rebbe says, this doesn't only mean the whole, in the whole Torah you can find everything, but rather in every piece of Torah, in every detail of Torah, really everything else is included, especially if you're speaking about a whole parsha. Nevertheless, usually the other aspects of Torah and the other aspects of the world are only hinted. And you need to work hard on finding it, on revealing it. Hafach means you need to search, you need to look. Where is in Parshas Kisisa the Chiddush is that in a revealed way, in a way of Torah Shemeksav, things being written down in a revealed, clear way, you could see that Parshas Kisisa is something that includes all of Seyder Ishtal Shalos, all of Torah, all of the things going on in the world from the beginning to the end. So what the Rebbe is going to do now is first explain how the world generally works, how the Abishta set up the world, all of Seyder Ishtal Shalos, and then show how that is in Torah and in Parshas Kisisa. So the Rebbe explains in Seyv Dalet. The Abish just set up that everything generally is divided into three. What the Rebbe refers to over here as Roish, Toich, and Soif. The head, the beginning that is, the middle, and the end. So of course, first of all, you have the beginning of every single thing, which will include what the whole purpose of whatever the matter is. Then you have the thing itself, and then of course from that you come to the bottom line, to the sachakol, to the end result of what you have at the end of any given thing. As we know, soif maise b'machshavat chilos. So there's the plan at the beginning, there's the actual thing, and then there's the result at the end. The Rebbe says, generally, this could also be seen as the three things of Torah, the world, and the Geula. The Rebbe explains. Torah, is the Yesoid, is the foundation, is the beginning for everything. As the Chazal say, Torah is called Reish is Darkoi. Torah is the beginning, it precedes the world. It is the purpose of why the Abishta created the world. Bereish is, the Abishta created the world because of the Torah that is called Reish. So that is Torah which precedes the world. That's the number one. Then comes number two, the world itself, the creation of the world itself, all of Seyder Ishtal Shalos, 
our avoider within the world to bring the world to its purpose. As we said, the world is Bishvila Toira. And then comes stage number three, the ultimate result, the bottom line, is by the Geulu Amitiz Vashleimo, when it will be fulfilled the purpose for which the Abishter created the world straight from the beginning. So again, we have three things, and this is going to be a very big theme in the Sicha. We have the beginning, and in this case, the Rebbe is explaining to us that Torah is the beginning, the foundation of everything. Then we have point number two. In this case, it's the world, and the whole avoid that we are doing within the world. And finally, stage number three is the Gula. These three things are hinted in the first three letters of the Aleph base. So we have, first of all, the Aleph, which stands for Anoichi Hashem Elokecha, the beginning of the Aseris Adibrois, in which all of Torah is included. So that's the Aleph. Then comes Beis. Beis stands for Bereshis Bara Lekimus Hashemayim Vesaaretz. Chazal tell us that the Abish created the world with a Beis. So the Beis represents creation, Bereshis. And then finally, the Gimel, of course, represents Geula. So Aleph, Beis, and Gimel. Aleph is Torah, Anoichi. The base is the world, Bereish is Baral Akimus Hashemayim Besaretz, and Gimel represents Gula. Says the Rebbe, more specifically, we have all of these three things within the way the Abish creates the world, within the Seder Ishtal Shalos. So we also have the number one is the Abish's desire to create a world. That's number one. Number two is the creation itself. And number three is when the creation comes to its purpose through our avoid of bringing a likus into the world. And that is the third thing. To use the expression of Kabbalah and Chesedus, first you have the Oyrein Soif, which fills all of existence. That's called the Oyrein Soif before the Tzimtzum, before the contraction. Then comes number two, the Tzimtzum, of the way the Abishta removes all of that light. And now, so to speak, you have a void, an empty place. But the purpose of that is that from there you have the Gilui, which is the idea of the revelation of godliness, which will come afterwards when we bring in godliness into the world. And even this level of godliness, the way it's before the Tzimtzum, by making the whole world a dwelling place for Hashem, a dear Eloi is Baruch B'tachtoin. So again, just to summarize this last point, where the Rebbe is explaining how we could look at the world and everything and divide it into three. The number one, the beginning, the middle, and the end. The Rebbe explained that, first of all, that that is Torah, the world, and Geula. Then the Rebbe explained it, that we have that within the Aleph Beis itself, Aleph Beis and Gimel, representing the Aleph as Torah, the Anoichi, the Beis is Beresh, is the world, and the Gimel is the Geula. The Rebbe then explains how that is within the Seder Ishtal Shalos, how first you have the will of the Abishta to create the world. That's within the world itself that is also divided into three. The will of Hashem to create the world. The creation and the purpose of creation. And in the language of Chassidus we said, there's the Oyre Yusoyf, the way the Abishta is before the Tzimtzum. Then we have the Tzimtzum and then the ultimate goal is to bring down into the world the greatest light of Hashem. Says the Rebbe, since we know that everything comes into the world in, through Torah, Torah is the blueprints for the world, the Abishta looks into the world to create the Torah, therefore Torah itself, we can also see in Torah also these three ideas. And the Rebbe is now looking within Torah, seeing these three points. Number one, you have the beginning of Torah, which is Bereshis. Now Bereshis doesn't only include the beginning of the actual creation itself, but Bereshis is really hinting to that which comes even before that, to the Torah which precedes the world. And as we said before, the word Bereshis itself is really hinting that it's Bishvil HaToyrah Shemikras Reishis, that the world is being created for the Torah which is called Reishis. In fact, if you look at the Beis itself, what does Beis mean? Beis means it's second. That means the Beis itself is telling you and hinting to you that there is something before that. It's coming second to the Aleph. So number one, we have the way the Bereshis is hinting to that which is before the creation, to the Torah. Then, of course, we have the actual Bereshis, Barali Kimis HaShemayim, that's all as the actual creation itself. And we said even within creation, we divided that into three parts, the way the Abish is creating the world, as discussed before. Then we have all of the Parshis and the Torah, which is discussing everything, the way it's what's going on in the world, and our avoiding fulfilling the purpose of the world, which is all Bishvila Torah, as we said. 
And as the Torah elaborates at great length in the Chamisha Chumshe Torah, and then we have at the very, very end of the Torah, and this is point number three, is the way the Eibishter is showing Moshe Rabbeinu, the end of the Zoysan Baruchah, it says the Eibishter is showing Moshe Rabbeinu everything that's going to happen, Ad Hayoyim O'Achran, until the very, very last day. And furthermore, the Torah concludes about all the miracles and wonders that Moshe Rabbeinu did in front of all of Yisrael, which this is the very, very ending of the Torah, which is, of course, connected to the Shleimus, to, to, to the perfection, to what we're going to have by the Gu'ulu HaMitiz Vashleimus through Mashiach Tzitkenu, we know that Moshe is the first Redeemer. And the last Redeemer, when then too we will have the greatest Gilu Yalikos, these miracles as discussed in the end of the Torah, Le'enei Kol Yisrael, in front of the eyes of all the Yidin. As it says, Kimeit Seischa, Meyeretz Mitzrayim Alenu Neflois. So what do we have over here? Here what the Rebbe is saying is that within Torah again we have a hint to these three ideas. Again, the Bereish is Bar Elikim. First of all is hinting to that which comes before the Bereishis, which is the Torah, as we explained. Then comes the whole world, which is being discussed in the rest of Torah, how we're dealing with the world and so on and so forth. And then you have the very, very ending of the Torah, where discusses, first of all, Hayoyim O'achra and everything that happens until Mashiach comes in afterwards, and also all the miracles and wonders that are going to be, which were in the times of Moshe Rabbeinu, but also hinting to the miracles and wonders, the way they're going to be when Mashiach comes. Says the Rebbe in Pirkei Avois, we also had these three ideas. The beginning of the Pirkei Avois starts with Moshe Kibbul Torah Misina, which is again the general idea of Torah, and that, as Chazal tell us, that everything that any proper Talmud will be Mechadish will come up with in future generations was also given to Moshe Rabbeinu at Ar Sinai. So that's number one. You have the way Moshe Rabbeinu gets the Torah, and that includes really everything, the way it's going to be, what's going to come out later, so the potential for what's going to happen afterwards. Then you have point number two, where Mesorah, he gives it over and passes it down to future generations, commands them to set up more Talmudim and teach Torah to future generations and so on and so forth. This is all about the tradition and passing down Torah from generation to generation as the Torah comes out in a revealed and detailed way through the Talmud Vosik as well. So that's stage number two. And then you have the end of Pirkei Ovis, Hashem Yimloich Lo'elam Vod, which includes the, the continuation of time for, to the end of all time, which is referring to the Ge'uloha Amitiz Vashleimo, when Hashem Yimloich Lo'elam Vod, when Hashem will rule forever. Asid Lavoy, when the whole world will be completely submitted to the Abishta's kingdom, which this is the whole purpose of why the Torah was given over and, and passed down from generation to generation. So again, the Rebbe is looking at this concept of three in all of these different areas. It says the Rebbe via Shalimar that this is one of the reasons why we know that Matan Torah is very much connected to the number three. As the famous Gemara that says, Gebenched is the Eibishter, blessed is Hashem that gave a Torah of three to a nation of three. Through Moshe Rabbeinu is considered the third, third in his family. And on a day that was third, after the Shlosh Yisimah and Bolo, etc. And in the third, the third month. And in fact, Reb Nisim Goin goes on to explain many more things which are to do with the number three in connection to Matan Torah. But why is it that we're emphasizing so much the number three? Because, based on what we explained before, it is through Matan Torah that the whole purpose of all of Seyder Ishtar Shalos is fulfilled. We explain that Seyder Ishtar Shalos is divided into these three areas, the Roy, Shtoich, and Soyv, the beginning of everything, the middle and the end. And that's why Torah itself is also referred to as Tlisoy, a Torah of three, or as we said before, the concept of Aleph, Beis, and Gimel, Torah itself includes all of these three things. Now that we have understood that the way the whole Torah works is in this system of three, says the Rebbe in Sevav, now we can see how all of this is in a very open way in our Parsha. So we have the three themes of the first set of Luchos, then the Chet Egel and the Shviris Luchos, and then the second set of Luchos, which the Rebbe is now going to explain how these are the three things. The first set of Luchos were engraved with the Aseris Hadibrois, the way the Eibishtad said them at Matan Torah, starting with an Aleph of Anoichi. The first set of Luchas, that's like the Aleph, that's like the basis for everything else. That includes the creation of the world, which was created for the Torah, which is called Rashis, etc. 
So that's Luchas Rishonois represents the highest form of Torah, the way it's higher in the world, etc. Then comes stage number two, the actual descent of the Chet Eagle, which brought about to the breaking of the Luchas. This is all hinting to the idea of the base, the general descent into the world, like a Bereshah's body, the Abish just creating a world. There's a world where it is now possible to be sin. There's a world where there could be a breaking of the Luchas. As it's known that the Chet Ego is con- very much connected to the first sin that happened in the world, the Chet Eitz All of that is very much connected to what's known as the Tzim Tzumarish, the first concealment that the Eibishter himself made in the light, and the, what's called the Shvira Sakelim, and then also connected with further things that happened at the beginning of creation, when the moon had complained and the moon had, had to become smaller. So all of these various different Tzim Tzumim, all of these various different descents, which all ultimately allow and enable that there should be some sort of Averis in this world, practically in this world. But the whole purpose of this, of course, is that through the Avoida down here in this world, even through all these descents, we will bring about the purpose of why the world was created for the Torah, as will soon be explained. And finally we come to point number three, to the Luchis Acharoinois. They are the ones that express the Gimel, the Aliyah that's going to come through the descent and through the Shvira Saluchis. And the Rebbe explains. Chazal tell us on the words Le'enei Kol Yisrael, which we quoted before, the very, very last words in the Torah, what everything that Moshe Rabbeinu has done in front of the eyes of all the Yidin. So Chazal tell us that it's actually referring to the breaking of the Luchis. The Moshe's heart sort of stirred within him to break the Luchis in front of the eyes of the Yidin. As the Pasuk says, Va'ashabrein Le'enechem. And the Eibishter had actually agreed to Moshe Rabbeinu. As the Pasuk says, Asher Shibarta, the Luchis that you have broken, the words Asher Shibarta could also be understood as Yasher, Koicha Chasher Shibarta. Like, well done or thank you for breaking the Luchis. The question is, of course, what's so great about breaking the Luchis that the Eibishter has to tell him, Yasher Koyach? So the Rebbe explains that just like through the Cheto Egel, the Yidin gained in becoming on the level of Baal Tshuva, and in fact, the whole concept of sin was only in order to elevate them to this level, as will soon be explained. Which Bali Tshuva is even higher than Tzadikim, as we know that the place that Bali Tshuva stand, even Tzadikim Gemurim cannot stand there. And are not, not only they don't stand there, and Yecholim, they're not even able to stand there. In a similar way regarding the Shavir Saluchos, which came from the Chet Egel, that the real reason, the inner reason, for why there had to be such a thing, is that there should actually come addition and, and added things in the Torah itself. The Luchis Acharoinois had certain advantages over the Luchis Rishonis. As the Chazal tell us, that the Abishta said to Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe Rabbeinu was all upset and sad about the fact that the Luchis broke, said the Abishta to Moshe Rabbeinu, don't be upset about the Luchis Rishonis. The Luchis Rishonis only had the Aseris Hadibrois in the second set of Luchis. It is also going to have included in it halachos and medrash and agoda. It's going to be keflayim l'tushi in a double measure. As the Gemara says, if the Yidden would have not sinned, they only would have gotten the chamisha chum sheitoyra and say for Yoshua. As the pasuk says, ki beroiv chachma, roiv kas, which literally means which with much wisdom is much anger. But in other words, that so to speak, with the anger of the Abishter. They now got, got even more wisdom, even more in Yonim of Torah. Or as Rashi says, Lefisha Boatu Vachatu, because they sinned, so the Abish that gave them now, so to speak, more Chachma, more work. But the point is that they got much more Torah and more wisdom now. And therefore, says the Rebbe, this is actually the advantage when we say that Luchis Harishoinois were made by Moshe Rabbeinu, he had to carve them out. And not made by Hashem, by, like the Luchas Harishoinois. So we're now actually going to be looking at the advantage of the Luchas Harishoinois, of the second set of Luchas. The first set of Luchas, which we called before the Aleph, the number one, is the way Torah is being given from above. That, of course, gives us the Koyach, that we should be able to do our Avoida, that is the base, the second stage, and ultimately getting to the third stage, to the Gimel. Just like simply the Aleph is the beginning of the Oiseus, and that leads you to Beis and Gimel. However, 
Since the Aleph on its own, meaning the Gilui, the revelation from above, is very high, completely removed, and not really permeating the Tachtoinim, the Beis, the Bereshis, not really coming into the world, therefore it's possible that that could cease, that, that could stop, that it could be a Shavita, that that could break. Because the world itself, the, the world, the Bria, is not really prepared and ready for it. And in fact, that's why the Torah starts with a Beis and not an Aleph. Because the whole point is that it needs to penetrate into the world. And therefore there was first the preparation of 26 generations until Matan Toyota, etc. So that is all the Aleph, the Gilimu Milo, which didn't actually last. Whereas the second set of Luchas, which comes through the Avoid of people, through the Avoid of Tshuva, and the Luchas themselves are made by Moshe Rabbeinu. Davke here, the whole purpose is fulfilled to reveal in the world itself how it is for the sake of Torah, and therefore, Davke here, there is the Luchis Acharoinois, these Luchis that don't break, and Adraba, on the contrary, it includes, as we said, even more, a double measure, and in a way that Torah, the Luchis, remain Beshlemus, remain complete forever and ever, and never, Chas Vesholem, even Shaykh, that they should break. And in fact, eventually and ultimately, this brings to the third point from the Luchis Acharoinois. We now move to the Gimel, which is the Geulah Amitis Vashleimo, which then will be revealed completely the Milo of Tshuva, the Milo of Yidin doing Tshuva for the Cheto Ego, the special Milo of the Luchis Acharoinois, which came Davke through breaking and after breaking the first set of Luchis, which is, as we said, the Milo of the Avoid of the person down here especially through tshuva, to fulfill the whole purpose of creation, which, as we said, is Bishul HaToyer. So, in other words, what we see from all of this is that in Pasha's Kisisa, we have in a revealed way these three things that we spoke about before. We have the Aleph, that is the union of Torah, the way Torah is higher than the world, the way it's erasious, before and higher than the world. That's represented by the first set of Luchais. We have the base of Bereshus Bara, which is, in other words, having a world where there's shaykh to be sin and shaykh to be problems, etc., etc. And that's represented by the whole story of the Chet Egel and the breaking of the Luchais. And finally, we also have the idea of the Gimel, which is the conclusion of all of Torah, Le'eni Kol Yisrael, the Asher Koicha Choshashi Barta. We have over here this idea that Moshe Rabbeinu broke the Luchas, but that led to the Luchas Acharoinois, to the greatest advantage that comes, Davka, because of the Chet like the Avoid of Tshuva, which is going to be revealed, as we said before, by the Gula. Says the Rebbe in Sev Zayin, and all of these three things in Pasha's Kisisa come as one flow, as one continuation. You might ask, how could you compare the Luchas Rishonis, which are given from above, to the sin and the breaking of the Luchas, which came because of a problem down here? Even though, yes, it's true, it brought us something greater. But the bottom line is, there's an Aveira over here. So how can we put them all together? So the Rebbe explains, because these three things, these three stages, is all part of the Seder, the way the Eibishter himself has set it up. The Eibishter set up that everything should be divided into these three categories, as we said, the Aleph, Beis, and the Gimel, the beginning, middle, and end. That is, that after you have the beginning, then you have to come to the whole middle, which is the Avoida, through which the Tachlis and the purpose is going to be brought about. And then, through the Avoida, you could finally come to the end result. Says the Rebbe Vyashloimar, that this thing that we call the Beis, this that the Eibishter set up, that there's a world, and that there's a Tzimtzum, the world where we have to be dealing with our Gashmis, the every day-to-day life, where there's a possibility for sin and so on and so forth, is not only regarding the general creation the Amish to set up, but also the results, and even, in fact, the sin and the breaking of the Luchas, which came, as we said, because of the Tzimtzum, etc., etc. And the Rebbe explains how that works. Chassidus tells us on Apostlech, Noiro al-Lilo al Odom which literally means that the Eidishter's deeds towards mankind are awesome and amazing and so on. But there's another pshat that the Medrash says, that the Chet Eitz the sin of Eitz Adas, sort of, in a sense, was just blamed on Adam or Ishain. Because the actual fact that it could sometimes happen, that the Eitz Ahara overcomes the person and causes him to sin, that itself is because Mila 
the Yetzirah was sort of incited against the person to bring him to do this Aveir. In other words, a Yid on his own is Bechal, not Shaykh to the whole concept of Sin Chas V'Sholem. The whole idea of why sin is even possible is only because the Amishta wanted in his great kindness to bring the Eden to the greatest Aliyah, higher than that, that which they are on their own. And therefore, as the Medrash puts it, Alilon Mislaboy. It was just almost as an excuse or blamed on Adam or Rishon. And there was this descent that happened temporarily, similar to the Pasuk Berega Kotoin Azavtich, that I'm leaving you go, I'm abandoning you for a short moment. And only Bechitsoinis, only Lemari Soinayim, only to that which seems to the eye. So any Yeri, all of these Yeridois are only to bring about the greatest Aliyah Shaloi Be'erech, and not only an Aliyah for a short moment, as the Pasuk says, Rega Koten Azavtich, that I'm abandoning you or leaving you for a short moment. So Chas V'Sholem, that, that will see also for a short moment, rather the Aliyah now is going to be eternal in a way that there's absolutely no interruption at all, as it will be by the Gu'ulo HaMitiz Vashleimo, which comes after the great Yeride in Golos. We will have the Gu'ulo Nitzchis, She'ein Achare Golos, an everlasting and eternal Gu'ulo, after which there is no Golos, and Adarab will only have Aliyos, greater and greater Aliyos, one after the other, as the Pasuk says, Yehul Chumei Chayil El Chayil, Yehroel El Yikim Betziyin, going from strength to strength, and be able to appear in front of Hashem in Sion. In addition to the general rule that we know, that every Yerida is Tzoyre Chaliyah, that every descent is always for the purpose of an ascent, so regarding Bnei Yisrael, the Yerida itself, the descent itself, in reality, is not a Yerida, is not a descent, but rather it is the way to a greater Aliyah, Shaloi Be'erech, incomparably greater to what you had before. And the Rebbe says, similarly is also with the Chet Ego, which is similar to the idea of the Eitz Adas. Just like by the Eitz Adas, we said it's only really to bring to a greater Aliyah. In a similar way, the Gemara tells us regarding the Chet Ego that really the only reason the Chet Ego took place is only to eventually allow the concept of Balei Tshuva. Yidin themselves, really, it wasn't fitting that they should end up doing such a terrible act of the Chet Ego. The Abishta, so to speak, caused it to happen in order to give an opening for Bali Tshuva and future generations. So what do we see here again? The whole point of the Yerida is only in order that they should be able to be the idea of Tshuva. In fact, says the Rebbe, this is also emphasized in the fact that the base of Bereshus, which we just said includes the world itself, but also the Yerida, the descent, and the sin. As we said before, the base itself is indicating that there is an Aleph before, the Aleph of Anoichi. So in other words, the base, which is Bechitsoini, is representing a Yerida, a descent into a world and into sin, is itself really telling you that it's coming after an Aleph? In other words, recognizing that there is the Anoichi Hashem Lekecha before it and leading to the Gimel of the Gula. Based on this, as the Rebbe, we can now understand that all of these three in Yanim are in one parsha. The Luchais Rishon is the first set of Luchais, the last set of Luchais. And even the Chet Egel and the breaking of the Luchais in between, have they're all part of a parsha. And which parsha? Named Kisisa. And furthermore, not only are they one flow, but they are all one Indian. It's all about Kisisa, it's all about lifting up the Bnei Yisroel. It's divided into three stages, the Aleph, Beis, and Gimel. The three th- ways of how to lift up Yidin. And the Rebbe specifies. Number one, the Aleph, is the Luchis HaRishonis. That simply elevates the Yidin. In the most literal sense, Matan Torah. The Beis, as we said, is the Chet, the sin, and the breaking of the Luchis, which the Eib stands up thanking Moshe Rabbeinu for that. That brings about the union of Tshuva, giving an opening for Bali Tshuva, Beginning with the tshuva of the Yidin at that point, including also the greatest gilu that comes from the Eibushta as a result of that Yid Gimel Midus Harachamim, etc., and the whole order of asking Rachamim, and so on. And finally, the Gimel, the greatest Aliyah by the Luchis Acharonos, including the shining of Moshe Rabbeinu's face, and of course, eventually, the Gilu of the Gula Mitis Vashleimah, which is all included in this as well. Says the Rebbe. Based on this, we can explain that the reason why the Luchais 
are discussed over here in Parshas Kisisa. We asked before, it should have been in Parshas Mishpatim. Why is first we have Parsha, the whole story of the Maisa Mishkan, even though the breaking of the Luchas, as we said, was before the Mishkan? So the explanation now is, because making the Mishkan, which is the purpose of the whole Seder Ishtal Shus of the whole world, to make the Dira B'tach for the Eibishter, is all about revealing in the world how it's all for the Torah and for Yisroel, as it will be revealed completely in the third base of Mikdash, Mikdash Adnei Koinon Yodecha, the base of Mikdash that Hashem himself makes. And therefore, after the Torah concludes telling us about the command of Hashem to Moshe about the Mishkan, which is in Parshish Truma Tetzav in the beginning of Kisiso, before Moshe Rabbeinu goes ahead and tells it to the Bnei Yisroel in Parshish Vayakel, the Torah first tells us about these three general stages in fulfilling the ultimate purpose, the Aleph, which is the first set of Luchais, the Beis, which is the Yerida, the descent, the breaking of the Luchais, etc. But it's all really about to bring something even greater, the Gimel, which is, of course, the Luchais Acharonis. After seeing how in the story of the Luchais Rishonis, the Cheto Egel, and the Shvira Saluchais, and the Luchis Acharonis include these three general ideas of all of Seyder Ishtashos, the Rebbe is now going to expand that to the rest of the parsha. That is, to the beginning of the parsha, which is speaking before the story of the Luchais, as well as to the end of the parsha. And the Rebbe says like this, in Sif Tes, more generally we could say that in the whole of Parsha's Kisisa, from beginning to end, we also have these three ideas. The beginning of the parsha, the Aleph, is Kisiso as a Rosh Bnei Yisroel. That refers to lifting the head of the Yidin. That refers to the Rosh, to the beginning of all matters. What is the beginning of all matters? Yisroel and Torah, for whom the world was created. As we know that the world was created for the Torah that's called Rosh, and for the Yidin that are called Rosh. Especially the Rosh Bnei Yisroel. And as the Rosh himself is standing in a way of Kisiso, of being lifted up. The Rebbe adds in the brackets now, even more specifically, within this itself, we also have really the other two ideas. Because in a Rosh, in an Aleph, you also have included the continuation, the middle and the end, the base and the Gimel. So really, right over here, right in the beginning of Kisi, so you have the three things. They are, in the beginning of the Parsha, again, first of all, the Kisi, so the Rosh being lifted up. Then you have the Yerida, the Oivei al Oivar al literally means those that are passing by to be counted, but Oivar al in some places, I believe this is what the Rebbe is referring to over here, some places it's also translated as those that are Oivar on the Pikudim, on the mitzvahs, that means the idea of Averis. But then there's also the Aliyah included in these Psukim, Lechapar al Nafshri Seichem, the atonement for your souls through the Koifar Nafshri, through the Machtas HaShekel, that was given. So that's within even Kisis of the three things. But here the Rebbe is more speaking about the whole Parsha as a whole. So in the beginning of the parsha, Kisisa has a Rosh Bnei Yisrael, that's the Aliyah. That's the way things are happening in the greatest way, in the highest way, Torah and Yidin. Then you have the continuation of the parsha, the Beis, which is generally the whole story of Chet Egel, the Shviras Haluchis, etc. And then we finally have the Gimel, the ending of the parsha, first of all about the Luchis HaKaroinois, but all the way to the end, end of the parsha, about how Moshe Rabbeinu comes down and his face is shining. And now the Eden are even afraid to go over to him because he's shining so bright. This is similar to what says at the end of the Chamisha Chum Torah, but all the wonders and miracles that Moshe Rabbeinu did in front of the eyes of all the Eden, in addition to also in our parsha, as it says, as in the flies of the Abish is saying that he's going to cause all of these wonders and miracles and so on, which this is all connected to the Gimel, which we explained before, the ultimate and the purpose of the Geula and so on. The Rebbe says... In this week's Parsha, we also have, as mentioned before, the Sholish Regolim. The Sholish Regolim, we can also see how they tie into these three ideas. Chag Pesach is the Rishon, is the first of all the Yom Toivim. And that's the Aleph. It's also Chodesh Aviv in the spring. Now, first of all, the word Aviv itself, we have a look at the word Aviv. In the word Aviv, it starts with an Aleph, and then you have a base. So, Chodesh Aviv and Pesach is all about the Gilui coming from above. This is the time when the, when the produce, when the grain is starting to become, when it's, it's starting to become ripe, etc. 
Then you have Chag HaShavuos, which is the second one of the Yom Yom Toivim. It's a time when you're cutting and the time of reaping the wheat. And this represents the avoid of a person down here, Mumato And then you have finally Chag HaOsif, the Yom Tov of Sukkot, the time when you gather the fruit. Chag HaOsif, Tkufas HaShana, when you're gathering the produce into the house, which this is the third of the Yom Yom Toivim. But it also represents the asifa, the gathering of the produce, also represents the shleimus of all of the avoida by the gu'ula, amitis vashleimu, when all the yidn will be osoif, will be gathered. Osoif asifim, nuum Hashem, as the Pasuk says, that all the yidn will be gathered, and all the sparks of kedushal of the whole world will be gathered together, hinted by the idea of Chag Osif. Says the Rebbe, if you now we can also understand the chidush of the special bright, shiny light that was coming from Moshe Rabbeinu, that came specifically by the Luchai Sacharoinois, which we asked before, why by the Luchai Sacharoinois, says the Rebbe, this is similar to the special advantage of the Gimel, that comes Davka after the Avoid of the base, after the Chet HaEgel and the Shemir HaLuchis. And the Rebbe explains, it was specifically by the second set of Luchas, which came through the descent, through getting involved in a world, in a lowly world, which, as we said before, that was that came about after the Shemir Saluchis. Now we have to have what's called Avoidus Habirurim. We have to be involved in the world. But it's Dafka through this that we are bring about the Gilui of much greater levels of wisdom within Torah, the deeper levels of Torah, the essence of Chachma, the way it's higher even than that which was in the Luchis Rishonis. And that's why by Moshe Rabbeinu himself that received the Luchis. He was actually shining, similar to what it says, Chachmas Odom Toyer Ponov, that the wisdom of a person illuminates his face, which this is such a great and high oil, which was higher even than his slapshus and coming down than being able to be contained. On the other hand, since the special advantage of the Luchis Sacharoinis came because of the descent and getting involved in a world in a base, Psalacha, as it says, the Moshe Rabbeinu had to take stones from within the world, not stones as it says in the first set of Luchas that the Abishter made the Luchas. So it's about taking the stones of the world, transforming, making a lowly world into oil, into a better place. So therefore, when you had the Koran Oyer Panov, when Moshe Rabbeinu's face was shining, so the Pasuk says, Vayiru Migesha Selav, the Yidin were afraid to walk over to him. And Moshe Rabbeinu had to put a covering on his face to block that great Gilealikos that was in Torah, which is higher than Birurim to being involved in the world. However, this concealment of what Moshe Rabbeinu was covering his face is not for the Yidden as the Yidden are on their own. The Yidden on their own, the Abishter also speaks to them directly without any concealments. And that's why when Moshe Rabbeinu speaks to the Yidden, when he was commanded, he would actually take off the covering. The Yidden would see how Moshe Rabbeinu's face was shining. It's only when Moshe Rabbeinu and the Eden have more of a connection to the world, because they have to get involved in the world and clothe themselves in the birurim and so on, that Moshe Rabbeinu needs to cover his face so that the world can also be able to accept the Gilu and not completely be nullified by it. In other words, the whole purpose of the concealment is not a concealment for the sake of concealment, but rather that the inyonim of Moshe Rabbeinu and Torah should be able to be accepted in the world. And through the avoid of a yid, in refining the world, he brings about that even as a yid is inside this physical world, he should be able to accept the gilu of Moshe Rabbeinu's glow and shine, as it will be b'shleimus by the gula, mitis v'ashleima by the gimel, where the pasuk says v'loyi kani foid moirecha, v'hayu einecha royo ises moirecha, that the yemishter won't be concealed anymore, and even as they are in this world will be able to accept and appreciate godliness. And in fact, the world itself, the nigla kvayd Hashem, they're all flesh, will be able to see godliness. Even Mikir Tizak, even the stone will cry out from the wall, that every single aspect of the world will be able to see the koyach apoyol benifol, the koyach of the Abishter in all created matter. Says the Rebbe in Seif from these three things in Pashas Kisiso, we have a lesson in the Avoid of Yid for all times. As said before, since we read this Parsha once a year, there is a lesson for the whole year. And especially when we stand on Parsha's Kisisa itself, when we're reading and need to live with the whole Parsha. 
A yid has the koyach to achieve and bring about all matters, all in yonim, from beginning to the end and everything in between, like from Aleph to Tav, or as we said before, from Aleph, Beis, and Gimel. Starting with these three things, as they are, they are in the avoid of every single day. And the Rebbe explains. Right when a yid wakes up from his sleep, as soon as he becomes a new creation, he says, That is that the Aleph, the foundation, the beginning of a yid's avoid of, is the bitul, the submission of himself to the Eibishter, to the Aleph of Anoichi. So much so that the Yid's whole existence, his Aleph, his Ani, his I, Moida Ani Lufonecha, his whole Metzius, his whole existence becomes one with the Ani, with the Anoichi of Hashem, as we say, Yisrael, the Kuchabrich, Kulachad, Yidin, and Hashem are all one. And as this is hinted, in the shape of the Aleph itself, we know that the shape of the Aleph, there's a Yud on top. A yud on the bottom and the loin in between. So the Rebbe explains the yud or the yid down below represents the yid. The yud on top represents Hashem, and then there is the loin that connects them. It is known what it says that the simplicity of a yid is connected and is one with what's called pshita sa'atzmut, where the aimish is beyond definition and limitation. And this simplicity of the yid is expressed in a revealed way when he says moidani. When he's completely submitting himself and without any names of Hashem being mentioned, becoming one with Hashem completely. And that's why the meaning of Yidin is that all Yidin, even the tiniest, littlest, smallest children, say Moidani. Furthermore, within Moidani itself, the word Moida is secondary, is bottled to the Ani. Because the main thing you would assume over here is the Ani. As soon as you wake up from your sleep, the first thing is the person. He's awake, he's alive with his 248 limbs, 365 veins, etc. And then he starts doing something, saying something, say, say, so you would think the Ani is the main thing. And yet, what do we say? We say, Ani. We don't say Ani Moide. In other words, that the Yid is so much connected to the Eibishter that even before the Ani, even before he's around, nevertheless, there's the first thing is right away the Moide. He's completely submitting himself to the Eibishter. So that's the Aleph. That's number one. Then comes Birchus HaShachar and Shachris, going to Shul, going to the Beis Medrash. This is all still part of the Aleph of the day, the Torah of the day. Then comes the Beis. When the Yid gets involved in the work of the world, he's going out from the Shul, from the Beis Medrash into the world. This is the Beis, Bereish is borrow. He has to get involved in the Avoid of the world. Hanig ben Minik Derecheretz is getting involved in business and so on. He's doing business in an honest way, of course, but he's involved in the world. That's the base. Then comes the end of the day, the Gimel, when the Yid is completing the day, when he's making his Chesh ben Hanefesh, he's making the Sachak, or the bottom line for everything he has done in the day. Generally, of course, this is first of all in Mairiv, finishing off with Ach Tzadikim Yoidu Lishmecha, once again, submitting himself and thanking the Eibishter, like Moidani, but now as, a, as an end, as a completion of the Avoida. And finally in Krishna Shalamita, where he's completely giving himself over to the Abishtar, Biyotcha Afkidruchi, completely giving his Nisham over to the Abishtar. So this is in every single day. So too, in the general Avoida of Yid over his lifetime, Larichus Yami Vishalam Taivis may be for long and good and happy and healthy years. The beginning of the Avoida, the middle of the Avoida, and the complete and culmination of the Avoida. Especially in our generation, the last generation of Gaulus, the first generation of Gaula, after having so much of Maaseinu Vavidaseinu of the Yidin Zavoyda throughout all the previous generations and years, that now we're definitely at the, at the end, that we've completed already the very last Birurim, the very last things that needed to be refined. So now what's mostly emphasized, first and foremost, is we highlight and we focus on the fact that we're at the completion of the Avoida about bringing about the Gimel, the Ge'ulah HaMit is Vashleim of Apoyal Mamash. Says the Rebbe in Yud is the Koyach for all of this, that every single Yid could achieve all of these things from beginning to end, comes from that first Aleph, from the fact that the Aleph, the Ani, of each and every single Yid is connected to the Aleph, to the Anoichi of above, so that even the way a Yid is down here in this world, the whole world is created for the Yid, that's called Reishis, the Yid is the beginning of all of creation. And the Rebbe says the way we have the Koyach to be Megala, to reveal this in each and every Yid, comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. 
and so too from the Moshe Rabbeinu in each and every generation. And in our generation, that through him all of these three things are achieved. That is, the Luchis are Yishoynois again, that which is like the Shvira Saluchis and the Luchis Acharoynois. And along with finally the Karne Ahoid, the, the shine, the bright shine, and the glory that follows all of that. Especially, says the Rebbe, when we are in Shabbos in a time when we're reading the part the all of Parshas Kisisa Esroish Bene Yisroel. Sisa simply refers to Moshe Rabbeinu, he's the one lifting up. That in addition to the fact that generally Yidna called the Roish, so this through the Koyach of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Yidin are lifted up. Nesiyas Roish, Kisiso Es Roish. And that gives us the Koyach to be able to bring about all of the continua- the things that are in the continuation of the Parsha. Again, the Aleph, which is the Luchai Sari Shoinois. The Beis, which represents a voida within the world, even when you're in such a lowly place and there's problems and so on. Nevertheless, to transform them. And finally reaching to the level of the Luchis Acharoinois with the Karne Ahoid, with all of the glory shining, which every single year is the Koyach to be able to receive this by doing the Avoida in the world. He's, he's poil that also the world should also be able to be a Kaili to receive all of this. Furthermore, in addition to the fact that each and every year receives the Gilu of these Karne Ahoid, of these rays, so furthermore, each and every Yid himself on his own gets these Karniyahid because each and every Yid has a Moshe Rabbeinu inside of him. We know that the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya, referring to the Maimar Chazal, the Gemara and the Posek. The Posek says, V'yata Yisrael, and now Yidin, what is Hashem demanding of you? Ki im liyiras Hashem alekecha, but only to fear. The Gemara asks, is fear such a small thing? The Gemara responds, yes, for Moshe Rabbeinu it's considered a small thing. So how does that help us? Now the Rebbe explains, because each and every one of us also have a Moshe Rabbeinu inside of us, and therefore fear of Hashem is considered a small thing. So the Rebbe asks, but if that's the case, the Rebbe asks an interesting question. What does it mean, Milsa Zutrisa? If we're speaking about Moshe Rabbeinu, how is there anything that's considered small or petty or little? And the Rebbe explains that really within Moshe Rabbeinu himself, there's a number of levels. There's the feet of Moshe, the body of Moshe, the head, the crown of Moshe. And therefore, in regards to the lower level of fear, which is connected to the feet of Moshe, similar to Apostle Ragli Yomashar Anoichi Bekirbo, where Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking by the Yidin and is referring and says the feet of the people. So regarding the regal of Moshe Rabbeinu, so to speak, there's something called Milsa Zutrasa, there's something small or petty. But higher than that, Moshe Rabbeinu also contains higher levels. That which you would consider not small, but rather bainan, middle or average. And then there's the things that are big and great. That is the level of the head, or even higher than that, the crown, which is above the head. And that's the idea of the rays of Moshe Rabbeinu. That is the level of Keser, as it's known, it's the concept of Keser, Malchus, and so on. And so too we understand regarding the Moshe Rabbeinu inside of each and every Yid. That because of this, a Yid actually includes inside of himself all of the levels, from the smallest to the middle to the biggest. And even the level of Keser, these rays of glory, and the Chiddush over here is, that the idea of Keser is Dav Keshayich only to Yidin, and not to Klippa. Yidin are the ones that are called B'nai Molochim princes, or even kings. And that is that every single Yidin, all times and in all situations, even in Golos, Every single year has this level of keser, these rays and shine similar to Moshe Rabbeinu. In the Koiches HaNefesh, the Rebbe explains, the level of keser refers to the level of rotzoin, the desire, the inner willpower of a person, and really the idea of Mesiras Nefesh. And that is that the desire of, his, of every single year is the rotzoin, that the yid has, the will to Hashem that a yid has is full strength at all times, and therefore the Yidin always have the Koyach, and always had the Koyach, to be able to withstand the Inyonim of the Golos. That is, that even when sometimes the Yid's Ratzah into matters of Kedusha was a bit Behelem, but really inside his desire always is to fulfill the Ratzah of the Eibishter as the famous Psagdin of the Rambam. 
Needless to say, in the beginning of the Golos, when, as the Gemara says, Vatoyus to be made, every do is still some revelation of the base something there's still left over. And for a certain amount of time, they were even being Makadish, the, the, the month, the moon, based on what the Edus would see, etc. But even afterwards, even in the depths of Golos, the Kesser of the Yid, the rays, the glory, the shine of the Yid, is shining and is there full, with a full strength. And this is even more so in Man Malker Abonon, the real king, which these are the Chachamim, the Sheftayr, the judges and the advisors in each and every generation. Until our own generation, starting with Kavoyit Kedush Asmeri V'chami Admuna Sidereinu, as a preparation for the time of Shiva Sheftayach Kavari Shenevi Atzayach Kavatchilo, and the Amish will be back, the judges and advisors as they were in the beginning, starting with and headed by Melech HaMashiach, the Yorei in Karen Meshicha, he will bring back Malchus based of it to its original state, and build a base Amigdash and gather all of the Yidin, and all of the mitzvahs will come back and be fully be able to be fulfilled as they were originally with offering carbonis, etc. And the Rebbe concludes, the Ratzoyim, in Sif Yud Gimel, this is, that standing in Chodesh Adorishan, it was that year, which is a preparation for Adar Shani, and one Gula comes right into the other Gula, Purim straight into Pesach and Chodesh Nisan, the Chodesh Agula. Then immediately we'll also have the Gula Amitiz Vashleimo, and therefore Chodesh Adar Shani and Chodesh Nisan, will both be Chodesh Chodeshim of Geula in a way of Mismach Geula Le Geula, especially that we will continue to fulfill the Eroes of Chazal, the Mishanich Nasad or Marbim Besimcha, especially that we're holding quite a number of days after the beginning of Adorishan, and that year was already after Purim Koton and Shushim Purim Koton, which are a preparation for Purim Godel and Shushim Purim Godel. In a way, as it says, Zeh Koton Godel Yehiyah, the small one will become big. And not only in the future, but already in the past and the present, by having celebrated Purim Katna, Shushim Purim Katna with great Simcha, and continuing the Simcha every single day in a way of Mailim Bakot Bakaydash, so then the Godel Yiyah will be that the Purim Godel and the Shushim Purim Godel will be even greater, greater than great. And through Simcha, through joy, we break through all barriers. Until the main thing that in the last moment of Golos becomes immediately the first moment of Gola, Ma'ayd Vuhu Iker. Take it for me, Yad, Mamsh.